Would you open your Bibles, please, to Revelation chapter 13? And we will get into 14, but there's something about 13 that we need to get to. Before we get into Revelation, I wanted to give you a very brief prophecy update. Every once in a while, something pops in the news that is worthy of mentioning, especially if you've been with this study in Revelation at any length. And even more so if you were not only with the study here in Revelation, but the study that we had in Daniel prior to the study in the book of Revelation. And you find over in, I'm not going to have you turn there because I just need to be brief. This just kind of propels us into what's going on next. But you'll find in, for instance, Ezekiel 38 and 39, something that doesn't appear to be Armageddon, but it is a fierce battle of an invasion of Israel that involves a number of different nations or territories. And it's instigated by God. In other words, it's his timing when it happens. It's going to be a decisive, overwhelming victory, not for the forces that attack Israel, but for Israel, which will overwhelm its enemies and bring such destruction on its enemies that it will take seven years to clean up the mess. It's going to be pretty radical. However, you also have in the book of Revelation, as we've been reading, well, you've got a demonic army that over earlier on, as we've been reading, will be invading from the east called the kings of the east, which is also mentioned there, mentioned in Revelation 16. We'll get there in, I don't know, a few months, years, I don't know, whenever we get there. And then you have this demonic army that, that invades, of course, from the east, that is huge, numbering 200 million. It's vast. And we've covered this before. What's interesting is that in the midst of all of these, a name keeps coming up, especially in the book of Daniel, but having to do with a country that seems to well, kind of spearhead the rage against Israel, surprisingly, because it doesn't resemble that which was in the Old Testament, Persia. Persian army and the Persian, the, the, the uh, empire of Persia in the Bible was ruled by a pagan, but a very reasonable man, Cyrus the Great. Cyrus the Great, well, he was also an imperial man. He would conquer, he would kill, he would do terrible things. But he also issued edicts that allowed people like the Jews to go back to their own land and worship God in the way that they wanted to, to rebuild their temple if they wanted to. That's pretty reasonable. Unfortunately, it has been the habit of Persia since its existence to believe that it somehow had the right to rule the world. And this continues to this day. The Iranian people are Persians. Every Iranian that I have ever met is a really good person. I have not met an Iranian terrorist or a bad person. I have met tremendously good and virtuous people. Some are Muslims. Some are Christians. They're good people. But their leadership is insane. Their leadership has an insane view. There's no other way to describe it except if you add the word demonic view against Israel, that they are bent on Israel's annihilation. And they have been for a very long time, on again, off again throughout history. And the camp, not Camp David, excuse me, the... Um, Sorry, the Abraham Accords. I went back too far back on that one. The Abraham Accords, which came about during the Trump administration, were brilliant because it really 
framed up the issue in the Middle East, prophetically even, in a perfect way. Well, almost. In that Israel was the center of attention in the Middle East for most countries. Not for Egypt, not for Jordan, and not for Saudi Arabia. A few other minor groups of people there too. But all in all, Israel, one of the smallest countries in the Middle East, was considered the biggest villain in the Middle East by Middle Easterners. And then along come the Abraham Accords. And suddenly, the conflict is redefined. The truth really becomes inevitable that it was Iran, the leadership governing Iran, that really wanted to cause the problems and conquer the Middle East, not Israel. Israel will defend itself, dangerously so. It will defend itself. You don't want to hit them. They hit back way too hard. Of course, that's a God thing. But when it comes down to Iran, suddenly the attention is put on Iran that who's the real problem in the Middle East for Middle Easterners? It's the leadership in Iran. Once again, don't look upon the Iranian people as villains. Bless them. One of the biggest revivals in the world is still breaking out in Iran. Christian revivals. Please don't, don't misunderstand what's going on there, but the leadership is nuts. And they're obsessed. And suddenly, along comes Trump, Netanyahu, and a few other diplomats that were at play. And they get to the Middle East to realize that the real problem is not Israel. Israel is a reactor. The aggressor is Iran. And now you have the entire Middle East focusing on containing Iran. Last year, Putin attacked Ukraine. It polarized the world. It brings China into the scene where China wants to support Russia because if Russia has the right to invade Ukraine, China has the right to invade Taiwan. You see how the political mentality works. So we'll support Russia because if we say Russia doesn't have the right to invade Ukraine, then we don't have the right to invade Taiwan. And they want Taiwan with a blind passion. They want it. So they come to the support of Russia. The U.S., unfortunately, has a weak administration. I'm not trying to get political here. Just stand back and look, and we do. That's the bottom line. Russia took advantage of those circumstances. They would never have ta attacked Ukraine were somebody else in office, Donald Trump or anybody else for that matter. But our administration is not strong and is not determined. Because of that, keep going now, stay with me on this. Because of that, you have the conflict in Ukraine, China owning our debt, which is in the trillions of dollars. Now, don't get too upset by that because we buy everything from China. If we stop buying things from China, they call our debt and the entire economic system of the world collapses overnight. So it's economic mutually assured destruction. So the conflict with China and us is mostly verbal. Yeah, it's diplomatic, it's verbal, but it's unlikely to go to hot, except Taiwan. With all of that, to annoy the West, who is supplying weaponry, fuel, and what have you, to Ukraine against Russia, is this complicated or what? This is politics. To annoy the West, China gets with Saudi Arabia and overnight makes peace between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Saudi Arabia and Iran did not get along at all. In fact, 
Saudi Arabia has even given permission to Israel to overfly their country if they want to bomb Iran. They hate Iran that much. Now there's a peace pact that was brokered by China with Saudi Arabia and Iran. The entire dynamic of the Middle East flipped overnight last week. And then Russia gets involved. And Iran, China, and Russia begin holding maneuvers in the Gulf of Oman, war games, together. Now you do the math on this, and I will never, never, never predict when Jesus Christ is coming back. But if it were to happen tomorrow, next week, next month, even this year, and again, I will not ever say that. I'm just throwing out a hypothetical that you can see just how close biblical prophecy is to coming to fulfillment. To an army of 200 million, the kings of the east coming across the Euphrates from east to west, Iran's over there. So is India, which is no friend to Israel. So is China, which is friends with Iran, which means they're no friend of Israel. So is Russia. Russia has never been friends with Israel. And that whole natural gas thing that we talked about a month and a half ago, which continues. The whole natural gas pipeline production that is put out there by Russia, follow the money. Follow the money. It's an economic war that's going on in Ukraine because all those pipelines, most of them anyway, go through Ukraine from Russia to, to Eastern Europe. And when those things get caught in the fray of war, then Eastern Europe has to rely on other pipelines coming from Russia. And Russia wants to own the pipelines going through Ukraine. You can see it's a very complicated mess. But when you line it up with biblical prophecy, end times prophecy, you suddenly realize just how dynamic things are in this world today. Could it go on pause for a thousand years? Yes, it could. But I look at it right now and I scratch my head and I go, I never thought in my lifetime I would see what happened last week. Where China would come in and flip the entire loyalty of the Middle East, the most important country in the Middle East other than Israel, Saudi Arabia, to become friends with Iran, which means Saudi Arabia is not friends as much with us, with the West, and perhaps even with Israel. So, here we go. I just thought I'd give you a little update on that. So, if you'd look in your Bibles, please, to Revelation chapter 13. In Revelation 13, last week, we talked about the mark of the beast. We talked about how the people who were handed the book, while the ink was still wet, as it were, in other words, it had just been written. They read it. They are understanding all the imagery in this book. They get it. They don't necessarily get the outcome. These are ways of discerning the outcome when these things begin to be fulfilled. But the imagery is very clear. That the whole mark of the beast thing is, first of all, a perversion of marks of God that God put on people. When God marks somebody, it's really good. It means that he loves them, he protects them, he takes care of them. He's, he might even send people into great tribulation, as it were, concerning Ezekiel 9. Remember we read Ezekiel 9 last week, where there were six angels in a vision with swords that were going to go and do a lot of harm to God's people. To God's people. Why? Because they'd gotten into idol worship, heavily into idol worship, in Judah, around the temple of all things. And God sent Babylon in to take them into captivity for 70 years. And during one of the sieges, Ezekiel sees this vision of these six guys, but he sees a seventh angel who's a scribe. And he's told to command the angel, go and put a mark on everyone who is not weeping over the condition of Jerusalem. 
In other words, they don't worship idols. They worship God, and they're just inconsolably upset because of the idol worship that has overtaken the nation, the people, even the temple itself at that time that would cause God to come in and grab all those people and put them into isolation in Babylon for 70 years before letting them return home. That's God's faithfulness. It's faithfulness to his promise that, listen, if you follow my commands, you do exactly what I say, I will bless you. It'll be supernatural. And if you don't, then there will be curses. I will curse you. The curses that God brings on, if you read it over in Deuteronomy chapter 28, which is a very long chapter, you find that the curses are not supernatural. They're entirely natural. God just lets nature take its course. And wow, it's scary. And that's what's going on. And so these people were to be marked so that even though this terrible siege would happen, even though they would go into captivity, that they weren't going to be harmed. They're going into captivity, not going to be harmed. These are the saints. These are, by definition, the Jewish people of that day, of that age. And that's exactly what happened. But along comes the Antichrist. And he also establishes a mark. And the mark looks just like, in those days, what we spent a lot of time talking about, so I refer you back to last week's study, Caesar worship, where it's who you worship. And if you don't worship Caesar, that is like taking a mark, the same type of mark that Satan perverts from a good mark that God gave to people, to a wicked mark that looks good. That if you only worship him, the Antichrist, like a Caesar, then everything's going to be fine. Commerce will continue. You can buy your groceries. You can sell your wares. You can exist economically. But if you don't worship the Antichrist, if the Antichrist is not Lord of your life, and you don't declare that, then nobody will buy from you, nobody will sell to you. In other words, they will starve you, and ultimately they will kill you. That's the mark of the beast. And at the very end of the chapter, verse 18, this calls for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast, for it is man's number. His number is 666. Now, what is that 666? Let me tell you. I don't know. <laughs> and neither do you. And neither does anybody else. Because this is for the people who are going to be there. When this happens, they will be able to calculate it. Right now, we can't. Because we don't know who this person is going to be. When they show up on the scene, the Jews will know it, especially the Jews. The whole world will, but especially the Jewish people who are in the tribulation, those who go into it. Because the Antichrist at one point, because of his flunky, the false prophet, his PR man, sets up an image, presumably of himself, in the temple of God in Jerusalem, which has not been rebuilt yet, but someday will be, perhaps very soon, and then tells the world, worship that image. Take that mark, and everything will be fine. When that happens, the Jewish people will go, Aha! I know who that is. And it's during that time where you can say, is this the right person? Calculate the number of his name. How do you do that? Well, there are ways of doing this without complicating anything that the Jewish people have ways of numbering their letters and then spelling out names and then the numbers mean something. Don't confuse this with Bible codes, which are, in most cases, the stupidest thing that's ever worked its way into the church to confuse people and divide churches. It's really, though a lot of those things are just delusional, unfortunately, and overzealous people trying to quantify God and fit God into their box so that they know exactly what he's going to do and how he's going to do it when God says, I'm only telling you this, I'm revealing that much to you. 
I'm not going to tell you everything. You don't need to know everything. But we think we do, and we're tasked to. But the Jewish people did have ways of quantifying things. And one of the things that you can do, I'm not saying you personally, but you can read up on this in almost any good commentary on Revelation, uh, and I'm talking good commentaries. We're talking about big-name commentaries and what have you. They will show you that using, for instance, at this time, Nero's entire name, which is a lot of different names, it adds up in a Hebrew sense, if you use Hebrew letters, not Greek letters, to spell his name, it adds up to 666, 666. Except by this time, Nero is long dead. But he sure made an impression on the Christians. He sure made an impression on the Jews. He made an impression on the world. And you know, without going into further detail, what type of impression that was. He was a bad guy. At the time the book of Revelation is being written, there's a different emperor in power, Domitian. And his name doesn't add up to 666. So what we're looking at here for at least the ancient people reading the book of Revelation, the Antichrist is going to be something like Nero. How bad is he going to be? Think Nero. What's he going to be like? Think Nero. They've also been taught, think Antiochus IV Epiphanes. We've talked about him before. If I'm confusing you, please go back and listen to the previous studies. We go into detail on these guys. They're prophetic figures. They're in the Bible. There are details about them. So 666, 666, some people say, well, 666 could mean, remember, 7 is God's number, 6 is man's number, even Satan's number. If it's not 666, 666, not the Messiah, not the Messiah, not the Messiah, not God, not God, not God, it could be that too. Is it that? Maybe. Maybe not. But you needed to know this. Now, I want to, at this point, before we hit chapter 14, I want to insert something about how someone like the Antichrist, could possibly come to power. How could that happen? That mystifies people. Militarily? Well, not at first. Well, in, in, politically? Well, yes. But how is it that somebody, one man, <clears throat> could gain the influence that he has over the entire world and hold it in his grip? Well, it's Satan. Sure, absolutely it is. Satan's power virtually unleashed in this world. But you see, there's a little bit more to this. And it's something that, interestingly enough, you all know already. Because it's happening here. Here, where here? In the United States of America. And it's happening elsewhere in the world. It's truly taking hold in big ways in Europe, in Latin America, in many of the countries there, in Australia, many of the countries there, parts of Africa. Uh, it's happening around the world. And it's catching on like wildfire. How will the Antichrist come to power? Chapter 13 was all about him coming to power. Satanic delusions, uh, uh, deceptive miracles brought on by the false prophet. And the false prophet, being a false prophet, is speaking allegedly for God, small g, read the Antichrist. How will he come into power? Today, we're seeing the foundations for his blasphemous regime being laid. How so? I, I'm going to give you a couple of quotes here. Now, listen to me carefully. Put on your thinking caps. I know you didn't come to church for that. Put on your thinking caps. In his latest book, I don't usually quote from books in this manner, so bear with me. This book is not the Bible. This book is not the Word of God. And the author would be horrified if anybody thought it was. 
but he's British. He's an observer of what goes on in the United States. He's also an observer of what goes on in Europe. And his name is Oz Guinness. Some of you are familiar with him. He has a great deal of integrity. Uh, Oz Guinness has made it very plain that he is an Episcopalian and he is a preterist. So what we're talking about in the book of Revelation, he would theologically disagree with, though we would have a great time having a very, very good conversation because he doesn't judge people. He just says, I will listen. I have my stance, but I love Jesus. This is where I stand. Okay, fine. We can get along just great. In his analysis of what's going on in the United States and what's being passed along and absorbed by the rest of the world, let me read you this first quote. Thinking caps on? Got them? Plug them in. Here we go. Where God is held to be dead. God is dead. Nietzsche, remember? And here's this big word. I hate using words like this on Sunday morning. And postmodernism. In other words, there is no absolute truth anymore. If God is dead, then what can be defined as true? Nothing. God sets the standard for the universe. Sets the standards for all truth. If he's dead, then every man's truth is his own. Got it? So where God is held to be dead, and postmodernism is alive and well, everything is permitted. So long as you can get away with it, and you can hire a good lawyer. The result of such a rejection of objectivity, truth, and morality is, let me say it again, the result, got it? Of such a rejection of objectivity, truth, and morality, the result is vulnerability to confusion, vulnerability to suspicion, vulnerability to mistrust, and vulnerability to manipulation. There are no givens, either from creation or natural law with postmodernism. So everything can be constructed, deconstructed, and reconstructed at will, all in accordance with the fashion of the day, the trends. This leads to the abuse of words which leads in turn to an abuse of speech and images, and then to turn society into a hall of mirrors made of falsehood, unreality, and illusion. That's the Antichrist. That's how he does it. That's what he does. Oh, he does more. Remember, false miracles. We talked about that last week that are brought about by the false prophet, even fire down from heaven that convinces people what's going on. But it's all delusion. It's all deception. Paul sounded the alarm 2,000 years ago when he said the coming of the lawless one. That's the Antichrist. He calls him that. He's called that more than once. Think about it. The lawless one is one who has no boundaries, no laws, and tries to keep people from involving themselves with hard boundaries. That everyone's truth is their own. There is no absolute truth. There are no absolute boundaries that we need to abide by. No commands that we need to obey. The lawless one. Got it? The coming of the lawless one, Paul said, will be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. And they perish because they refuse to love the truth. What? They refuse to love the what? The truth. See, the truth is reality and God's laws, and God's established boundaries in life. 
They refuse to love the truth. They love the lawlessness. They love the trendiness. They love not being bound by God, but the uh, but unbinding the potentials of their flesh, perhaps their own intellects. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. You want to believe the lie, then I'll lock you into it. Remember, we mentioned this a couple weeks ago, but God, when he's dealing with Pharaoh through Moses, Pharaoh hardens his heart. Pharaoh hardens his heart. Pharaoh hardens his heart. God finally says, fine, I'll harden your heart. And he does. And he makes it impossible for Pharaoh to make a good decision, a right decision in God's eyes. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth, but have delighted, delighted in wickedness. Lies, lies, lies. Truth is dead. That's where this world is going. That's where America is headed and setting the standards for most of the rest of the world, so much so that in France, Macron, Macron, however you want to call him, the, the president of, of France, the prime minister, whatever, what's, what's his title? Anyway, whatever it is, he's the head, right? He's saying, don't listen to Americans. And they started it with the French Revolution, 1789. They're the ones that tried to get rid of God so that every man could, will invest himself in his own truth. And therefore, only the powerful could really control those people who were wanting to live their own truths. Very strange irony in that, isn't it? That's like the Antichrist. Even the French are saying, don't listen to America right now. And because they are. Because other nations in this world are. And they're following the lead because they're thinking, man, we can cast off the yoke and the burden that God's law put on us and follow after lawlessness because it's much more fun. Fill in the blank. Hedonism. My truth, your truth, which the Oprahs of this world and more are trying to tell us this is what we need to be seeking and living in without real truth is utterly meaningless. And as I have said a hundred times at least, that if you invest yourself in your truth, the news is that truth will die with you. It will not go beyond your lifetime. In other words, it's meaningless. And whoever has the power to fashion the new truth, they will rule the world. That's the Antichrist. Uh, let me read you 1 John here. 1 John chapter 2, verse 21. You can turn there if you like. I'm going to be quick. 1 John 2, 21. John same guy who wrote the book of Revelation, said this, I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it. He's writing to the church. He's writing to you. He's writing to us. Because you do know it. And because, listen, no lie comes from the truth. This is a Galilean fisherman saying this. You tell me the Bible isn't inspired by God. It's so in your face obvious that if it's the truth, there's no lie in it. And you, I'm writing this to you because you do know the truth. And then he says this in verse 22, who's the liar, John asks. It's the man who, who's the liar? Who's the liar? The man who denies that Jesus is the Messiah, that he's Lord, that he's Savior, that he's the Messiah. That's the liar. Isn't that what we hear in blogs and news stories online and on the radio, whatever that is anymore, where people will say who don't like the truth of God, they will simply say that, well, you guys worship the Christian God. Isn't that an interesting way of putting God in a locked box 
The thing is, no lock can hold him. John goes on to say, it is the man who denies that Jesus is the Messiah. And here's what he says next. Such a man is the Antichrist. He denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. And whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. How will the Antichrist come to power? You just read it. Lawlessness. And the promotion of lawlessness which we are seeing all over America and seeping into the rest of the world so that when someone comes along and says, this is our religion and I will lead you there, what do you think the world's going to do? Follow like sheep. And also, and don't be surprised at this, Jesus says this. The scripture says this in so many places that if they embrace that, they will hate you because you don't. One more quote by Guinness and I move on. Here's what he said. Thinking caps on? Got them plugged into the wall? Contrary to the modern idea that truth only exists in the mind of the people who believe in it, truth has an objective dimension. Put simply, if something is true or false, listen, its truth or falsehood is a claim about something. And what truth is about, listen, what truth is about is nothing less than the reality of reality. Lying is therefore an intention to deceive that creates an alternative reality or falsehood and unreality. A culture of lying fosters delusions. Didn't the Bible say that? Undermines freedom. Doesn't the Bible teach that? Distorts justice. Doesn't the Bible teach that? Blacklists disagreements and debate. We know this one from inside our own state. And poisons society. Lying is not only the enemy of truth, it is the enemy of humanity. This will be the Antichrist platform. No matter what happens in this country or what changes next, the Bible plays this out. I thought they were brilliant observations. Well, quickly, chapter 14. Chapter 14. Listen. That number 14, throw it out. It doesn't belong there. It ruins the context. God bless the well-meaning person who put it in there. It wasn't John. It wasn't the Holy Spirit. But it seemed like a logical place to put in a pause where you could catch your breath while reading the book of Revelation, and it wrecked the context. Here's what it says in verse 1. Then I looked, John speaking, and there before me was the Lamb, Jesus, standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. They're marked. And I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters, like a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of harpists playing their harps. You wondered where they get the idea of harps in heaven. There it is. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. These we were introduced to back in chapter 4 and 5. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they kept themselves pure. They follow the Lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among men and offered as firstfruits to God 
and the Lamb, and no lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. Wow, I'm confused. Maybe. Except for one thing. What does all this mean? Where is this going? Listen, to avoid confusion about an obvious revealing here of what's going on, remember this is one huge context. So what you're learning today, what you're seeing today as you read the book of Revelation is a lesson in context. When we understand this, the larger context clears up any confusion about the passage. The scene here, first of all, jumps ahead to the end. Remember I told you that Revelation is not always chronological. It's already proven that through the last two chapters, where it, and of course in the book of Daniel, where it gives you a lot of bad news and then says somewhere in there, yeah, but wait, we still win. And then it gives you more bad news, but wait, we still win. And here's some more bad news, but wait, we really win in the end. This is that sort of a thing. What did they just get as far as bad news? Chapter 12, Satan is hurled down. He empowers the Antichrist. He wants to destroy the Jews. They flee into the wilderness. The next chapter, you have the Antichrist coming to power, rising up. It's backing up in time. How he ascends to power and he uproots other kings and whatever it is and takes over and begins to rule the world even from a damaged position where he's been wounded severely and his eye and his right hand have never healed. You get that from Zechariah. Remember, if you know the Old Testament, you know the book of Revelation. Piece of cake. And then you're introduced to the false prophet. And the false prophet we just talked about who does the fake miracles and deludes the world and sets up the image of the Antichrist and the new temple that's going to be in Jerusalem someday and causes everybody to worship that, that image and then everybody to take that mark. If you don't take the mark, we're going to starve you out or even kill you. And he goes on and, and you have this terrible thing and you've got this mark on people's heads that it's from the devil. And then chapter 14, you have what seems to be a change in scene. Now we're going to talk about something different. Now nah, we're talking about the same thing. It's one of those times where God puts it in here for John to write, but wait, in the end, we win. Because you know how the Antichrist gave that bad mark? Let me tell you. Here are the good guys, and they have a mark too. And they are so in tune with heaven. Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophet, can't even touch them. See where it's going? And it says they're on Mount Zion. Now this is very often, and you might even have it in the margins of your Bible. Look it up yourself, read it yourself. But read the scripture without that number 14 first. And you'll see what's going on here. That it's often seen that these 144,000 are in heaven with Jesus, who has yet to physically return to the earth, and they're with all the, the uh, beings in heaven, the 24 elders and the four cherubim that are around the throne and a great multitude up there singing and harping with harps and all of that. When in fact, it's simply describing that, by the way, in the end, Jesus comes back to Mount Zion, which is all the hills of Jerusalem. It's not physically just one hill. Now, if you go to, on a tour to Israel, you'll go to a place called Mount Zion. It's where they have the Last Supper room. It's a commemorative site. Not, not It's, it's, it's uh, um, traditional. Uh, where the actual site was, we don't know. And it's a ridge. It's called the Mount Zion Ridge. But Mount Zion is also a very, very big name for where the Messiah will rule and reign from in the end. And that will be the place. And here it says that this 144,000 are going to be there with Jesus in the end, singing praises to God, totally in tune with heaven. As heaven is singing praises, they will be singing praises. As they're singing praises, heaven will be singing praises. Why? Because the Messiah won. He's there. He's come back. And those he protected, this special group of 144,000 Jews, he protected will be there with him, on Mount Zion, we're not talking heaven, we're talking about Jerusalem in general, at this time. In other words, John skips to the end to remind you that as bad as it can get with the Antichrist, guess what? We still win. We still win. So, 
I looked, and there before me was the Lamb, standing on Mount Zion, with the, and with him 144,000, who had his name and his Father's name written on their foreheads. Jesus, once again, is portrayed as the Lamb. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is what John the Baptist called him, the Lamb of God. Sacrifice. The perfect sacrificed Lamb of God. But when you see Jesus described as a Lamb who had been slain, keep in mind that on the Day of Atonement, they sacrificed goats. When was a lamb slain? Passover. Passover. And where was the blood applied? On the doorposts and the lintel of the house. In other words, that's what the phrase that we speak in Christianese means. We are under the blood. You're safe. Anybody during Passover that had blood of a lamb on their doorposts and their lintel, the angel of death passed over and did not affect that family. Anybody who didn't have it, firstborn of that family, whether it was a man, a woman, or whether it was animals, they died. This speaks of the protection that any Jew would see. The blood of the lamb the lamb, the Passover lamb, that they are in his house, as it were. They are protected by him. They are under his blood. So are we. Now, we have other ways of expressing it, too. God just doesn't use one thing. I mean, we have communion, the shed blood of Jesus, that we, that we partake of communion to remember that. Remember? We're reminded that Jesus shed his blood on a cross. And that was the sacrifice, the atoning sacrifice that washed your ledger clean, erased every last thing that God had against you on that ledger. So we express this in many different ways. In this particular way, any Jew would go, that's Passover. Who are the 144,000 Jews? Every last one of them. They're all Jewish people. The Passover lamb, in their case, whose blood protects against death, against judgment. We find that the 144,000, where we saw them earlier in the book of Revelation, now we see them again, go into the tribulation and go through the tribulation. And when they're going through the tribulation, they are unscathed untouched, unaffected by the Antichrist. Jewish believers, under his blood, sealed and protected, like those who are marked in Ezekiel chapter 9, from all harm during the tribulation. Let me read you another quote. This is by, I had to do it, I haven't done it in a while, Spurgeon. Okay, Spurgeon, Prince of Preachers, speaks in Victorian English, so bear with me. He says, and who were these people having his father's name written on their foreheads? He's talking about the 144,000. He said, they're not the B's for Baptists, not the W's for Wesleyans, not the E's for the established church. They had their father's name and nobody else's. What a deal of fuss is made on earth about our distinctions. We think such a deal about belonging to this denomination and that other one. Why, if you were to go to heaven's gates and ask if they had any Baptists there, the angel would only look at you <laughs> and not answer you. If you were to ask why they had any Wesleyans or members of the established church, he would say, nothing of the sort here. But if you were to ask him whether they had any Christians there. I, he would say, an abundance of them. They are all one now, all called by one name. The one brand 
has been obliterated. And now they have not the name of this man or the other. They have the name of God, even their father, stamped on their brow. That man had a way with words, didn't he? So in utter contrast to the terrors of chapter 13, to the edicts of the Antichrist and the false prophet, the mark of the beast isn't on them. The mark of God is. And that's why we have this passage in what we call chapter 14, but you rip that number out and suddenly it all just flows together that it's going to be horrible. And in the end, we win big. Those 144,000, they stand with Jesus in victory over the Antichrist. At the time when Jesus physically returns to the earth, on earth, in Jerusalem, Mount Zion, in chapter 13, the Antichrist, the beast, is given the power to make war against the saints and conquer them. Remember, the saints are the Jews. It doesn't mean that there aren't other people who get saved, become Christians during the tribulation. There are. The Gentiles. Many of them do. But he's specifically talking to the Jews because the Jews are God's people, and of all the people in the world, they might say, why in the world are you having us go through this? The way that any Jew that you might find in Israel, any given Jew, would say, why in the world did we have to go through the Holocaust? Why that horrible thing? And that's a tough question to answer. And for so many of the Jewish people, especially those in Israel today, they will respond with the mantra, after Auschwitz there is no God, because they didn't understand why. And the explanations are painful. And they're not for us today because we'd get off on something that would last the rest of the afternoon. But the beast, he makes war against the Jews during that time. And he's even given the power, as we saw in chapter 13, to conquer them. Except for these guys. Except for these guys. The Antichrist with all his power and rage, hasn't been able to defeat them. And in the end, there's a vast chorus in heaven, singing, playing harps, worshiping before God and his very throne, and the 144,000, and interestingly enough, no one else, are given the words to this unique song to sing. Connecting the very throne of God in heaven with the rule and reign of Jesus Christ on the earth. Now, a couple of things, and i got to finish because I know I've gone long. What else is new? 144,000 won't be the only survivors of the tribulation. Please keep that in mind. There will be other Jewish survivors kept safe in Jordan. We've talked about that. Elsewhere, we've talked about that. And Gentiles who didn't take the mark of the beast, there will be some that somehow survive. How do we know that? There are the sheep in Matthew 25, the separation of the sheep and the goats, because their judgment is based on how they treated the Jews during that time, whether they treated them well or whether they turned them out. That's the judgment of Matthew 25. And all this begs a question. If Jesus is victorious over the beast and his followers who took Jesus' mark, what happens to them? What happens to those who took the mark of the beast? That's for our next study, which actually kicks in at verse 9. We have a few verses to go through in the middle there. But there's something I want you to consider and that I'm actually going to move into and talk a bit about next week. And that's this. There are cults, one of them quite prominent, who claim that they are, in fact, the 144,000 today. I wouldn't want to be them because it means they're going into and through the tribulation. However, as we already mentioned, as I read through very quickly, these 144,000 are described 
as male virgin Jews. Now that demands some discussion right there, and we'll get to that. Not today, but we'll get to that. How could that be? The answer is quite simple. But there's 12,000 from each tribe of Israel. There are 12 tribes, 12 times 12,000, 144,000. Good number. And they take his mark, and they're kept safe. Now, they are going to be in the tribulation. We are not the 144,000. You are not. Don't consider yourself part of them. But here's what I'd like you to do. So I'm going to leave you with some homework because I've given you a lot of information today. It all starts coming together next week. God, Jesus, really likes the 144,000. They're very, very special to him. Not only because of the covenant that he made with them, which he cannot break. One of the great things God cannot do. He cannot break a covenant. He never will. What is it about the 144,000, this is your homework, that pleases the Lord so much? Because we're not them. But do you realize that other than their ethnicity, that what it is about them can also be about you right now, church. Their qualities are not exclusive to them. They are in the context in which they are living the tribulation in the future. What is it about this 144,000 that God so approves of that we can say, even though we are not the 144,000, what should we be looking at? in their lives, that our lives might be like theirs. That we might follow the way they follow Jesus. That's your homework. That's the question. And you'll find the answer by the end of verse 5. Not a lot of reading to do. Take a look. And we'll go back to it and dig into it next week. Father, thank you again for such tremendous words that you give us that paint pictures of your victory that as dismal as things can be in this world with the direction where things are going in this world that your victory lasts forever. And the misery of the world, the confusion of the world, the effect of Satan on the world is only a brief and temporary thing. Thank you so much, Lord, that in you, with you, because of you, we win. We're humbled by that because we know what we really deserve. You have blessed us so much. Lord, we leave here worshiping you. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen.